Let's open up our hearts now and pray in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for this day. We're halfway through now already. We pause to thank you and to worship you and to love you. And we thank you that you've created us. From all eternity, you had us in mind, each and every one of us. You've called us to different vocations, some priests, some motherhood, some single life, some fathers. We're grateful for our vocation. We want to live it well. And most of all, we're grateful for your love. You have lavished your sweet spirit into our hearts, and we want to, to know you and to love you back, to reciprocate. I pray that this afternoon, our hearts will be open to your grace and to your love. And I ask God's blessing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Remain standing. I want to have a reading. This is a proclamation from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. There was a woman of Samaria who came to draw water at a well, Jacob's well. This is chapter 4 of John. And Jesus said to her, give me a drink. And his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. And the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask me, a Samaritan, for a drink? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it was that was asking you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The Gospel of the Lord. Okay, be seated. That is from St. Peter's Basilica. It's an alabaster window about the Holy Spirit. Veni Sancte Spiritus. Remember, we're all about the Holy Spirit today, calling upon the Holy Spirit to come. And I wanted to tell you that during my seminary training, I was in Chicago. That's where I went to the Catholic Theological Union. Chicago is a very diverse uh, church community, and I had a choice of ministering anywhere I wanted to minister. And I chose an African-American church on the south side of Chicago. It was called St. Benedict the African. Because my spirituality is a little more charismatic, and I like enthusiasm, and I like to worship. And I found that the uh, African-American folk are really into that. I went to St. Benedict the African Church, and again, I was only a freshman seminarian. And I remember when I got there one time, one of the sermons, and they loved to clap during the services. and. I remember the priest got up there one time and he would, dialogical homilies, you know, I was learning about that and preaching and he goes, God is good. And then the people would shout out all the time. And then he goes, all the time. And they would, God is good. Oh, you, did you go to St. Benedict the African? <laughs> I thought we'd try that. God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. Very good. We're talking about God's love. And God is good all the time, even in the midst of a pandemic, even when things are going hard in your life and there's difficulties and sufferings and trials. God doesn't change. God did not probably cause the pandemic, but he's working in it to cause good. And that's the way God is. You know, one of my favorite scriptures is Romans 8. Uh, that's the chapter, I think it's 828, God works for good. All things work to good. All things work to good for those who love God. Because God is good all the time. So let me bring you to the story of the Good Samaritan woman. This woman did not have a lot going for her. She was divorced five times. And the man that she was living with was not her husband. And on top of it all, she was a Samaritan and they didn't get along with the Jews. Now she has this chance meeting with Jesus and here's this divorced woman, Samaritan, living in sin and this is the woman that Jesus is offering 
living water too. Of course, the Holy Spirit, a relationship with God, eternal life. And sometimes you can think, well, wait a minute. I don't think I'm worthy of God's love. <laughs> I don't think I'm worthy of the gift of the Holy Spirit. After all, I've done this or I've done that or I've got this in my past or I'm living right now in, in a way that isn't exactly perfect. And what this story is telling us is that no matter who you are, uh, God's love is unconditional. That none of us are worthy of it. We can't earn it. We don't deserve it. We can never merit it, but we can receive it. Right now, whatever, wherever you are in your life, I want you to receive living water because that's what endures. Again, you can't earn it, but you can receive it. I wanted to talk about that story of the Samaritan woman because it's so powerful. Sometimes we hear about it, but we don't realize who this woman was. And all of us have a past. None of us are perfect. But God still lavishes his love upon us. And I want to try to instill upon you how this has revolutionized my life, this being God's love. Pope Benedict, who is now retired, as you know, uh, Pope Benedict XVI, very intellectual pope. And he wrote an encyclical, and all the theologians and the scripture scholars are going to go, they're thinking, you know, this is going to be something very complicated because he's so intellectual and everything. First encyclical that he put out, it, was, it shocked everybody because it was this, God is love. It's like, yeah, we learned that in the first grade. And he used a word for love, and it was agape. That's a word in the Greek that means unconditional love. This is the way that God loves. Remember what Jesus taught? He said, God allows his rain. Remember last night, hit the rain to fall on the bad and the good, his sun to shine on the just and the unjust. God is such that indiscriminately, <laughs> he loves us. Janice shared very vulnerably about her abortion. Yet she's forgiven. And she's loved. And this is the way our God is. What differentiates her between other people that have had abortion? She received it. She allowed God to love her. She received forgiveness. I just spent an hour in there in the confessional. Women receiving the forgiveness, receiving the love. That's what I, I have a ministry to people in prison, and I always say the difference between prisoners and the Pope is God loves prisoners just as much as the Pope, but the Pope receives his love. Some prisoners do too, but a lot don't. I want to talk with you more about God's love because Romans 5.5 5 tells us that the Holy Spirit is God's love poured into our hearts. Because this morning I, I began talking about who the Holy Spirit is. Lord, giver of life, and God's love. And God's love is affectionate, very caring, very concerned for each one of us, very passionate, very intimate, but unconditional. I heard a story about a grandmother. I love to tell this story. And you know how grandmothers are toward their grandchildren. They love their grandchildren. They give them all these gifts. And well, anyway, this grandmother, she bought all her, her granddaughter and her grandson, teenagers, bought them gifts for Christmas. And, just wanted one more gift, went to the mall, and she's in a poster store, and she's flipping through the posters, and she sees a beautiful young man on a surfboard, and he's surfing Kawabunga, and he says, my grandson loves to surf, writes down the number, flips a little bit, there's a nature scene, beautiful, my granddaughter loves nature, writes down the number, gives the numbers to the clerk, clerk hands her two rolled up posters, she wraps them up, puts them under the tree, it's Christmas, all the gifts were open. The only two gifts that hadn't been open were the two posters, and 
The young man, you know, there's about 15 relatives there. The young man takes it out, unfurls it, and there's this young man, Kawabunga. And he's like, Grandma, thanks so much. I love to surf and can't wait until summer comes. I'll get back on the waves and I'll put it on the wall of my bedroom. And now the last gift to be open. It's the granddaughter's gift. She goes under the tree, pulls out the gift, unfurls it, and ah, her mouth drops wide open. What do you think she saw? It wasn't a nature scene. It was a big, fat, pink hippopotamus. And under, underneath were the words, but I love you just the way you are. And the grandmother saw it and said, wait, they made a mistake. I was supposed to give you a nature scene, and they gave you that big, fat, pink. I'm going to take that thing back. She says, no, Grandma, that's OK. It's fine. I like it. I'll put it on the bedroom wall. Well, she, about a month later, writes a letter to Grandma. She goes, Grandma, nobody asked me to the dance. I gained weight over Christmas. Nobody asked me to the dance. And I'm feeling sorry for myself and rejecting myself. And I flop on my bed sometimes, and I look up at that big, fat, pink hippopotamus. And underneath are the words, but I love you just the way you are. And she said, I can feel God's love. I think one of the problems that a lot of people have, I know I've struggled with it, women in particular, is body image and rejection of self. Uh, Self-esteem, not feeling good enough, feeling inadequate. And what has happened in my life is I struggle with it as a young man, and I still struggle with it some today, you know, there are, there are great preachers out there, and I'm just one of many out there, and I'm like, you know, there's so many others that could be here today, probably doing a better job. And, you know, I think about that and all these other things, and God's love for me has given me a courage and a self-esteem and a self-respect that I never had before. I'll put it to you this way. When I was in high school, I grew up in Massachusetts. I know English well. It's my first language, of course. And we were in English class in the ninth grade. And we were just going up and down the rows reading. And they came to me, and I started reading. And as I was reading, all of a sudden, I got distracted. I started thinking about the girl next to me and the football player on my right, and thinking, I wonder what they think about me You know, as I'm reading, because everybody was hearing my voice. And as I did that, all of a sudden, my heart started beating very quickly. I had anxiety. And really, what I was doing is I went through a panic attack for the first time in my life. I never had been, had one of those before. And I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't read. Everybody looked at me, and I turned beet red. I was probably the most embarrassing moment of my life. And my friend, my best friend, was sitting right behind me. He just started reading, got me off the hook. But the problem was, once that happens to you, the next time you got to read, it happens again. And you start thinking about it before you read. That's called anticipatory anxiety. And I don't even know how I got through high school. Because I suffered from panic attacks because I didn't feel good enough. And I had low self-esteem. And I rejected myself. I get into college, start studying business. And I don't even know how I escaped all those times where I had to read public. Never mind speaking in public. God touches me when I'm a freshman. Gave me an, an awareness of the Holy Spirit and his love. And I'm like, wow, this is so good. And then I get this sense that God is calling me to preach, to preach the gospel. And I felt this fire to be able to do that. And, and I really wanted to do it. Then I remember in prayer, I go, we just have one small problem. I'm scared stiff. How are we ever going to do this? And you remember Moses? You know, Moses stuttered. Did you know that? Jeremiah thought he was too young. Abraham thought he was too old. Everybody's got an excuse. And I had an excuse, too. Well, I'm happy to say that, yeah, I was ordained a priest. And I've been out there now for 30 years. And, but what God did not do is take away the fear and take away the panic. You know, I wish God would do that. You know, it's like, zzz, <laughs> and it's gone. Maybe he does that for some people, but I went through it the hard way. What he does rather is this. He says, Cedric, 
I love you, and I'm with you. And that's God's solution for any problem in life, really. He doesn't necessarily take us out of it. He says, I'm with you in it. And what you have to do is learn to trust God in those times, in those scary, for me it was terrifying. And I can't tell you what it took for me to get up here uh, eventually, you know, all those years ago. I was so scared that everybody was judging me and thinking I, I'm dumb or whatever it is. And, and I rejected myself and had all this, well, God's love has revolutionized my life. And I stand as a witness to that. Remember what I said this morning, rise. It was a resurrection for me. And whatever you're going through, maybe, it, maybe it's not self-esteem, maybe it's depression, could be grieving, could be despair, could be loneliness, whatever it is. God's solution isn't zzz, and he takes you out of it necessarily, although sometimes he does take you out of it. But he walks with us in it. And that's how we develop a personal relationship with God. It's not just on a mountaintop somewhere. It's in the real stuff of life. And I've gained trust. I'm not perfect. I still get scared. I remember uh, I've lost spit many times when I haven't been able you know, you ever try to say Jesus with no, Jesus with no spit? It's very hard. But the way that I was able to get to television and preaching conferences and preaching parish missions is by facing it and not running. And I proclaim that to you this afternoon. Whatever you're dealing with, face it with God's love, God's presence. Why does the Holy Spirit come? To empower us. Jesus said, behold, I give you power. And I always like to say the efficacy is in the intimacy. Did you get that? The efficacy, the power, is in the intimacy. As you get to know the presence of God with you, it's like, bring it on. I can do it. Because I used to be so negative. I can't do it. Everybody else is more talented. Uh, everybody else is better gifted. I don't have any gifts. I'm not articulate. You know, all the knots and I can't and the sweeping statements and everything. Now it's like, bring it on. I look at the stars at night. And I realize who put those into place. I see 7.9 billion people on the face of the earth. And I realize who gave them life. And I realize who it is who lives in me. And it's like, I'm not going to deter God's will by my own doubts, by my own self-deprecation uh, and put myself down. In fact, one of my favorite books is The Power of Positive Thinking by Norman Vincent Peale. And he says the number one, peop number one thing that people struggle with is self-deprecation. They don't feel good about themselves. They have low self-image, low self-esteem. And, you know, I'm, not, I, I'm very realistic. I'm still not the best at anything. But I'm tell you this, I'm, I'm courageous. I'm willing to try. I don't back down easily. I'm tenacious. I'm determined. I'm disciplined. I've got some gifts now. And I'll tell you what I do have is purpose and meaning. I, I love people. I want to reach out to people. And what evil was trying to do in my life was to keep me in a little box with no voice. So you live your itty bitty life and nothing. You don't really help anybody or do anything with your life. But what Jesus tries to do is give us Help us to realize our potential, live with passion, become all that you can be, achieve your destiny, and have a voice. I have realized how important it is to have a voice in our world today, a voice for truth. And uh, wow, God has changed my life. And I simply want to say this afternoon, face. Whatever it is, you have to face because God is with you. We are more than conquerors through Christ who loves us. That's one of my favorite verses, Romans 8. I wrote a book called More Than Conquerors. I didn't bring it with me, but More Than Conquerors. I remember one of our priests suffered with depression. 
He passed away, but he was in his 80s. He suffered with depression, but you wouldn't know it because the people at the retreat center loved him. He always smiled and joked and everything. And you might be thinking, well, wait a minute. If God loves us, you shouldn't have depression. No, no, I, I'll put it this way. Because God loves us, you can face depression. Now, this is different from some preachers that say, in the name of Jesus, all your depression should be gone. Yeah, I believe that, but I'm also realistic. And I've counseled you, and I've talked with you, and I realize that because the Holy Spirit's there, yeah, you might get incrementally better, but the bottom line is, is you can face it and not let it overwhelm you and be victorious. I think you know that I do ministry in the 12-step program. That's, I'm not in it, but when I was assigned to Houston, we have, we're a mecca for the 12-step program, for Alcoholics Anonymous, Overeaters Anonymous, Drugs Anonymous, Sex Anonymous, Gamblers Anonymous, all the anonymous. And I was introduced to this program, and I'm saying, this is Catholic spirituality. First step, you admit that you are powerless over your addiction. Second step, you believe in God. Third step, you surrender to the care of God. And the way that people are coming into recovery is by surrendering to God's love as they envision God, to the care of God. That's how you get better. That's how you recover from an addiction. You don't necessarily get healed from an addiction. You recover from an addiction. It's God's love that helps you to face the fact that you have an addiction. Those of you who have addicts in the family, there's something called codependency. And you get hooked in with them, and you have to practice detachment and forgiveness and self-care. How can you do it? Through God's love. You work the steps. God's love helps you to face the relationships that you have, the addictions that are in your family. Maybe you are struggling with an addiction. God's love will help you to face it. And not only face it, come into recovery. There's an epidemic going on in the midst of our pandemic, and it has to do with addictions. And with this many people in a room this large, and those who are watching by video, it's going on. And so God's love is very practical. God's love comes to help us. One of my favorite, you know, I'm on television, Trinity Broadcasting, six in the morning on Sundays, Daystar noon, on Sundays, EWTN occasionally, they interview me and I have series broadcasts, so I love doing that. But I've also studied preachers, what works, what doesn't work. Some of the preachers on TV, it's like, turn that off. Some of the preachers on TV are pretty good, even though they're not Catholic. I'm very ecumenical. One of the preachers that I like is a woman named Joyce Meyer. Have you ever heard of her, Joyce Meyer? Many of you have, okay. Joyce is not Catholic, but She's non-denominational, nothing wrong with that. And she had been sexually abused by her father. She had breast cancer. The abuse, the cancer, divorced from her husband. Sounds like the Samaritan woman here. And God forgave her. God gave her the courage through his love for her to not only manage her life, but to minister to people. And she puts it this way, my mess is my message. Like Janice this morning sharing about her abortion. Her mess is her message. My mess is my message. She taught me through her preaching to be practical, to talk about real life, to talk about what people are going through instead of this pie in the sky stuff that we've been given for so many years in our church, forgive me for saying that, but you know, I've grown up in it too, and it makes me angry because you deserve so much more. You deserve to have your issues talked about, what you're going through, the real life issues. And she really, you know, I went to the seminary, and I learned a lot in the seminary, but I've learned a lot through her about preaching. And yeah, she's not Catholic, but who cares? I mean, we're not going to have a Catholic section in heaven and a non-denominational and a Baptist and a Methodist. 
I mean, we're all going to be one, but granted, I'm not poo-pooing the Catholic Church. Don't misquote me. I love our church. I'm a priest. We have the fullness. There's no doubt in my mind. But other people have truth, too, and we have to learn from them. Well, anyway, my whole point is that she was a mess. And God is raising her up and has raised her up to speak to millions of women around this globe, on TV and in person, and people are being saved and coming to Christ. And I think that's beautiful because God works through the stuff of our life to, for good. That's Romans 8. And he's doing that in your life, too. If you could all get up here and tell your stories. I've met many of you already in the confessional and otherwise. Your teachers, your RCIA people, you're reaching out to people, bringing communion, lectors. I mean, you're the salt of the earth and the light of the world. You are the, probably the best group I ever preached to. I mean, you, you want to be here. This is history making. This is the first annual conference. But I want you to know God's love is for you right now in the midst of your stuff. Arise, women of Victoria. Victory, Victoria. You've got the spirit. There's power there. Well, let me continue. I wanted to share with you really quickly that of course, there's a lot of suffering going on in the world. And you might be thinking, okay, God, you're right, Father Cedric. God loves me. I believe that. But why the suffering? Why the pandemic? Why my suffering physically? Why do I have to go through fear, anxiety, all these different things that I'm going through? You know, maybe mood disorder, whatever it is. That's, Joyce talks a lot about moods and the moods that she goes through, menopause and all that type of stuff. Well, you know, it's real life. This is what people are going through. Why do I have to go through all this? Where is God in all this? Well, I heard a song by Amy Grant that I really like. You know Amy Grant, the Christian singer? It's called, uh, it's called, the song is called, Ask Me. <laughs> why, why losing your mind, right? Uh, it's called, Ask Me. And she talks about a young woman who was abused sexually by her father as a young woman. And she cries out, where is God in the shame? Where is God in the pain? Where is God in the suffering? And Amy sings her song, and she says, God is in the middle. Mercy in the middle. And I really like that because God doesn't cause the abuse or necessarily the pandemic or the sufferings that we go through. God's a God of love. He's our dad. He's our father. But he's in the middle of it when we go through things. That's his solution. He will never, ever forsake us or fail us. That's right from the book of Hebrews. And always remember, you are never, ever alone. Some of you have been abused. And you might ask, where was God during that? How could God let Joyce Meyer be abused by her father multiple years? He's in the middle. It's going to bring us out. He loves us even though. So never forget that. And I, I always think about that when I'm going through things, that God is right there with me. And I can do it. I can endure the hard things. I can be courageous. I can face my challenges. I wrote a book called Challenges Make Champions. And I found out in my life that when I have challenges in my life, like getting on TV and staying on TV and reaching out to people and writing books. That's what, that's what makes me strong and courageous. And I realize my potential. And so you all have challenges too. Raising children and grandchildren and struggling marriages at times and going through things with people at the church that don't agree with you and politics and all this and all that. But it's like, don't run from it. Be, be strong in Christ. Be victorious. Challenges make champions. I wanted to share with you that Psalm 139 is one of my favorite psalms. After, after confession, oftentimes I give it as a penance. Whether I sit or when I stand, God knows it altogether. The next word that's on our lips, God knows what it is. God surrounds us. So in other words, what I'm trying to say is, God's love is very intimate, very close, 
You don't even know what the next words are going to be that you speak to your neighbor or a little later on. You don't even, God already knows what that is. That's how St. Augustine put it this way. God is closer to us than we are to ourselves. And Psalm 125 says, If the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people. I'm trying to give you the impression that you are loved. And God's love is intimate, empowering, strong, passionate, unconditional, affectionate. Remember, an alcoholic gets into recovery because of God's care for him. He cares for us. Two fish one time were swimming in the ocean, and one looks at the other and says, hey, I've heard about the ocean. Where is it? The other fish looks at him, the ocean. He says, it's what we're swimming in. And people go, where's God's love? It's what you're swimming in. Look. Appreciate it. Discover it. I know you want to feel it. I do too. I'm half Italian. We love to feel. It's all about emotions. It's like, blow me over with your love. Remember what I was talking about this morning with the Holy Spirit. Everybody wants to feel the fire and the wind and the earthquake and all that. And yes, that may come, you know, Pentecost. But most of the time, folks, it's pretty ordinary. And what we have to do is work at appreciating it. Because we can get jaded very quickly and very easily. What I mean by jaded is, you know, we take things for granted. And we are so loved. I mean, the fact that you're here and God has given us life is such a precious gift. And we need to really work at it. There are 7.9 billion people. Did you get that? 7.9 billion people on the face of the earth at this moment. That's a lot of people. Yet, there's nobody like you. And me. We are distinct. We are unique. We're individual. Nobody has our f fingerprints or our iris print. We're totally different from everybody else. God has created us that way. He had us in mind, the scriptures tell us, before the world began. I wrote a book called You Are Loved. I have it on the table, and that's the symbol of it right there. And the reason why I wrote that book is because we all know John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten. So we all know that God loves the world, 7.9 billion people. But sometimes we forget that God really loves us individually. And that's what I want to instill in you right now, that just the way you are, that's unconditional, you are loved. Every heartbeat, you know, your heart's been beating a lot since I've been here. Every breath, Every moment, every thought is all the gift. If we can but get in touch with it and appreciate God's love for us. We are loved. I remember I went on a retreat one time. Retreat was going fine. I was praying. You know, I was in California and I was having a good time. Nothing, no big highs or anything. I got this insight to start writing down on a yellow sheet of paper uh, things I was grateful for, things like my parents and salvation, becoming a priest, God's love for me, uh, my health, uh, preaching, writing, you know, different things. And I just started, before long, I had a whole page full of things that I was grateful for. I stood at the door of my hermitage, and as I stood there, something transcendent happened to me. I was so aware of God's love, and I started to cry. Great gratitude, gratefulness, opens us up to God's love. Another thing, the scriptures. I had a conversion as a young man by reading Matthew 7, 7. Ask, and you will receive. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open. They had a, they being our leaders at the Vatican, the Pope and our bishops, they had a synod on the Word of God sometime back, 10 years ago or so, seven years ago, I forget exactly. 
And one of the archbishops got up and he talked about the scriptures as being a love letter from God to us. And everybody applauded. And I'm talking about ways to appreciate God's love. Spend a little time with the scriptures each day, maybe the mass readings. Uh, live with some gratitude. That's really good. My habit. This means the passion of Jesus Christ. I'm a passionist priest. Out of all the communities, why did I pick the passionist? Because God's love is revealed at the cross. When Jesus died for us on the cross, that, that's the great revelation of God's love. And we have a memory of the passion. That's my first vow. To proclaim God's love to all. Our founder, St. Paul of the Cross, said that uh, about the passion. He said, the passion is the most overwhelming work of God's love. So how do you appreciate God's love? Just look at a cross. Look at a crucifix. Go before the Blessed Sacrament. Spend a little time. These are ways to tweak our memory about God's love. And then, really quickly, oftentimes people will come to me to confession. Confession is a celebration of God's forgiveness, God's love for you. And oftentimes people are so burdened with guilt and condemnation and self-recrimination. I tell them, as your penance, just go outside and take a little walk. Just for a minute. Soak in the sun. Breathe the air. God loves you. Let go of the, the guilt and the burdens. As we gather this afternoon, simply want to remind you of something that you already know, that you are loved. I remember there was a priest that, when I first started to get on television, he helped me. His, father, his name was Father Mike Manning. He had a program on TBN. He was stationed in Southern California. He kind of took me under his wing and showed me the ropes and everything. His program was called Word in the World. And he was, he was always smiling. And he always ended his program. I end my program with, don't just live, live with passion. He ended his program with, may God's love for you make you smile. And I think that's so beautiful. Real recently, one of our priests told us he was preaching about the passion of Jesus. And he talked about the last words of Jesus being, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And he said, what are your last words going to be? And it kind of jolted me a little bit, because I never thought about that before. What are my last words going to be? So think about that for a minute. What are your last words going to be? Remember what I just said about Psalm 139? The next word that you speak, God knows it. He also knows what your last words are going to be, too. And after praying... And after thinking about it for a while, this is what I came up with. This is what I want my last words to be. Faith, hope, and love last forever. And that's what I try to preach about, what really matters. Faith, hope, God's love lasts forever. I went to that church in Chicago, and I loved it because people were enthusiastic, they were worshiping, they were praising God, and they were happy. And I remember the priest got up there and he said, God is good and... And then he said, all the time? And because God is good, we are loved. And may you sense whatever you're going through at this moment in your life, the power, the courage, the grace, to face your issues, and to be more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ. And may God bless you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.